This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewer's natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Well... You know, one of these days, I'm just going to fire everything up while we're talking during the pre-show here. We just, uh, we've been talking about eggs and uh, Mississippi Chris, he's got, uh, he's got these chickens that he got about, what, 11 weeks ago, he says. And uh, been, uh, been waiting for these things to start late. Now, he says he's going to get 48 eggs a week, guys. I mean, that's a start. That's yeah, just a start. But then uh, I guess he and his wife are into the into working out, going to the gym. Chris eats uh, what is it? A half a dozen egg whites. Yeah, I eat six in the morning. My wife eats four. I just uh, I, I don't know about you three or you two, but I just I, I got to have the yolk in mine. I just I can't do the egg. <laughs> But hey, yeah. uh, go ahead. You gonna say something? Oh, I, I was just gonna say. For me, it depends on how I'm having the egg. Certain things, like an omelet or something, if you're throwing a bunch of other good stuff in there, then I can get away with just the egg whites. But if it's just on its own, I, I think I'm with you, JD. Gotta have the yolks in there. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I do uh, prefer the yolky the omelet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, welcome to the Mead House uh, here again on Tuesday night. And uh, gosh, you know, and I started recording. I did record the after show last week. I haven't had a chance to listen to it, though, but uh, I'm going to keep recording them and I uh, might piece them together and uh, come up with that bonus track that we keep talking about. But uh, hey, welcome to the Mead House here tonight, guys. This is just a show where four guys sitting around a table talking mead uh none of us are experts uh but we all do like making good mead and that's uh kind of our thing uh we believe that uh making good mead's got to start at home here and uh this is what we do so we get together once a week here on tuesday nights and we share the show with uh, whoever might be out there listening live uh, if you're not listening live, uh, I know we're getting quite a few downloads uh, on the show, so we appreciate that. Uh, feel free to join us live here on Tuesday nights. Uh, you can even call the show, 818-921-4680. Uh, the number's right up there on the player if you're at the meathouse.com where we live. We do have a Facebook. Uh, it's just simply the Mead House. We're getting quite a few likes there, too. So that seems to be getting around. We don't do the Twitter, sorry. Uh, we just don't <laughs> tweet. tweet, twit, tweeter. We don't twit <laughs> or whatever the hell it is. Uh, but anyway, we do, like I said, have the, the website, themeathouse.com. Um, I uh, – was cruising around. Well, I tell you what. Let, let's let's get things rolling first because they're combined with a shout out. I kind of wanted to get into a discussion, uh, and this might string out for a while, uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. But first off, uh, what are we drinking here tonight, guys? Uh, Aaron, what what do you got in the uh, your glass tonight? Yeah, tonight I um, got this. Cayenne pepper capsicumel. This is a, a mead that I brewed and bottled back. I was reaching for the cap here. Bottled back in December of last year using clover honey and one cayenne pepper that um, that I had grown in the the garden back, you know, in the backyard. And um, to my first capsicumel, if I'm saying that correctly, it's the first one of these that I've done. And have to say, I'm I'm definitely a fan of this style. I think you know when we talk about balance of flavor and, and different types of 
things going on at the same time in a mead, the, the spice from a pepper is something that can, can really add an interesting dimension and kind of balance out that sweetness level a little bit. So um, it's kind of got an upfront, more of a sweet taste, and then the, the little burn comes in on the aftertaste, and uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Definitely would recommend this. Do you get do you get that cayenne taste? I mean, every, every pepper tastes differently. Uh, you do, and that was one of the reasons I I decided to go with cayenne pepper. So, um, you guys probably don't know this about me yet, but a lot of my close friends do. I am a Frank's hot sauce like fanatic. I, uh, you know, like the commercial says, I put that stuff on everything. So you and my wife, oh, yeah. <laughs> my wife will ruin a perfectly good piece of meat with uh, <laughs> yeah so how, yep. how, how did you treat the cayenne pepper before you you just chopped it up and added it or did you treat it to somehow cook it down and uh, roast it yeah i um just cut it up into slices took the seeds out and i don't know how much of a difference this made but i froze it first and the reason for that is just on on the fruit side, everything that I've heard is, you know, if you're adding fruit in, it's a good practice to freeze it beforehand because you kind of break down those cell walls a little bit and, and help with the juice extraction. So yeah. for a, a pepper where there's really not much juice extraction going on and you're just kind of extracting that heat, I'm not sure how much of a difference that really made. Um, but I did, I did freeze it first. Yeah. And uh, Jeff Chow's in the house tonight. Uh, what's in the cup tonight, Jeff? Oh, I found a, a chamomile mead that I made a little over a year ago, um, kind of in the back of my fridge. But I should try this, and it's pretty good. It's uh, it's still a little bit uh, acidic, which was the big problem I had with it when I first brewed it. Uh, but it has mellowed out a little bit, and it's tasting pretty nice tonight. Do you find... Um you know, I'm, I'm having an issue with a traditional that I started last September. It's this orange blossom thing I did. Uh, and I, I got with a guy who, I don't know, I, I'm still having some misgivings about the whole thing, but uh, kind of mentoring me along and had me adding some acid to it to, to kind of cure some pH problems I was having. And, I think it may have been a little bit too much, a little bit tart. I mean, do you find that uh, tart meads will calm down or kind of – does the tartness ever go away? I don't think it the acid – well, oh, Go ahead. That, what's that, Chris? Oh, I was going to say, if it's, if it's that bad, probably not because I know what you put in it. <laughs> Well, no, this 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 is a different one, Chris. This is uh this is this is not the pumpkin thing. That that went that cleaned out the drains a long time ago. Uh, oh, this okay. is, uh yeah, no, this is this is the orange blossom traditional that I made. Uh it's not it's not butt puckering tart, but it's not acceptable to me. Uh and I'm just you know, I'm just leaving it sit in a carboy hoping that Maybe it'll go away, but I, cause I, I don't know that there's anything you really do with it. I'm not going to back sweeten it to try to, you know, offset the tartness. So, but uh, mm. I, I was just curious. But uh, anyway, uh, Chris, Mississippi. Now I understand Mississippi, Chris, back in the operating room uh, already, right? Yep. Yep. Back, back at it. Work. Yep. Back at it. Uh, Carving up people, sewing up people, and uh, uh, doing his thing. So, uh, what's what's in the glass you got tonight, there? Well, I had a surprise. Uh, I thought I was pulling out a small bottle. I've only got a few left of a uh, strawberry banana, and uh, I thought that's what I was getting. But a long, long time ago, before I learned how to make mead properly. I made a plum mead, and it didn't turn out so well, so I stuck it back to age. And apparently I grabbed the bottle of it thinking I was getting something else, and it's no better now than it was then. <laughs> uh, but it needs to be disposed of, so I'm disposing of it. <laughs> but I'm chasing it with a Starbucks K-cup. 
<laughs> so, uh, <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. So we never let anything go to waste. <laughs> I mean, you know, turn it into barbecue sauce or something. I mean. Yeah, this is really, I shouldn't probably be drinking this. This is probably damaging me in some way, but uh, I'm going to drink it anyway. All right. (laughs) Well, well, uh, I'm drinking, I'm not drinking any mead tonight. Uh, I'm not even drinking a beer. I'm drinking a blackberry wine that I brought home from uh, Duplin Winery in Rose Hill, North Carolina. And this stuff is really good. It's not real sweet. So, I, you know, when I first, uh, when we were, this is during a wine tasting that the wife and I had, had gone to when we visited this winery there. And, uh, and uh, all of the wines that they make, uh, most you know, 99% of the wines they make in, in North Carolina is all from the muscadine grapes. And uh, this blackberry wine is made with the muscadine grape juice and blackberries, but it, it's not real sweet. I was afraid when she poured it in the glass that it was going to taste like a blackberry Kool-Aid, but it does not. It, this is really, really good. It's not real sweet, kind of almost on the dry side, and you definitely get the blackberry flavor. So I, I'm really enjoying the last. Uh, this is probably going to wind up being a couple of glasses tonight uh, of the bottle of blackberry wine. So uh, uh, tonight, you know, I, I was cruising through. There's a whole bunch of mead-related Facebook pages out there, and I, I try to hit up each one of them throughout the week. Um and, and tonight, uh, I was cruising through, uh, let's see, I think I wrote it down. Uh, it's just a plain mead Facebook page. Uh, and I was cruising through there, and I found the uh, posting by Robert Lloyd Moreland. Uh, I don't know where he's from, uh, but he put a post up. says he's a longtime beer home brewer and a mead melamel newbie. And he has five pounds of wildflower honey. And he's got a picture of all this up there on, on the Facebook page. He's got a, a five pound, uh, uh, five pounds of wildflower honey. He says he only plans to use three. He's got three pounds of cherry puree, uh, a gallon of spring water, Lalvin uh, K1-1116 yeast, yeast nutrient, yeast energizer, pectic enzyme, and wants to know if he's going in the right direction. And there's four or five different postings following, you know, replies to his post. But you know what? I I thought maybe we could help him out here a little bit too. Uh, And we'll make sure that he gets a copy of the show somehow. You know, even if I have to email it to him. But... Uh, how would you guys approach this? Uh, he's got he's got five gallons of wildflower. I think that's a good start. And uh, the cherry puree. I, I I don't know about I don't know what kind of cherries though. Makes a big difference. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And um, yeah. In what respect? Because I know one cherry is far more tart. <clears throat> than another, right? Uh, yeah, but if it's tart cherries, you can make a good cherry melomel. If it's sweet cherries, you can make a really good batch of Vicks Formula 44 cough syrup. <laughs> so, well, uh, oh, and that's what I've heard, too. Yes, I've done it. I, I say that from experience. Is there? Uh, I mean, you know, let, let, let's uh, let's say he's got the Vix Forty Four Cherry Puree. Uh, is there anything else that he can add to it to maybe cut that or uh, help him get away from that Vix Forty Four cough syrup type uh, flavor? If he's got sweet cherries, uh, use them to make a cobbler and. Uh Get some sour tart cherries for your mead. So just do away with with the cherry puree altogether. 
Yeah, if it's sweet. If it's something like a bean or a, a Rainier or something like that that's a, that's classified as a sweet cherry, uh, you do not want that in your mead unless you like cough syrup. And even the smallest amount will make cough syrup. I don't know why, but it does. Jeff, Baron. So I, while we've been talking, I, I jumped on Facebook here, and I think I see the post you're talking about. Um, as it turns out, this Vintner's Harvest Sweet Cherry Puree is one that I've used pretty recently. Um, I I had gone through and, and racked a batch of cl- – actually, I think it's the same five-gallon batch that this cayenne pepper capsicumel came out of. Um, I split it off into – um, like a, a three gallon carboy of the, the cherry with, I think I used two, two of those cans of that sweet cherry puree. Um, I think I did two gallons of, of peach also with the Vintner's harvest puree and then one gallon of the, the cayenne pepper. And, um, I, I had back sweetened these batches and got a little bit carried away, especially on the, the cherry one. So between, back sweetening with the honey and then using the the sweet cherry and and getting even more sweetness there that batch is very cloyingly sweet like over the top sweet so um i i think my first advice would would probably be to agree with chris and and if possible go with the the tart cherry just so you get a little bit more interesting of a balance of flavor between the sweet and the tart um However, one thing that I, I have done with, with a couple of bottles of this, this sweet cherry is to, um, add some, some acid blend to it. I think I've got a mix of like citric and tartaric and might be malic acid blend and, and that kind of brightens it up a little bit. Um, so, so that might be an option for, um, who is it that we're talking about here for Robert to, yeah, to Robert. use as well. Um, just one other thing that I've done as well to, to kind of cut that sweet, um, sweet cherry is I've, I've blended it with a very dry sparkling batch of orange blossom honey mead that I've got sitting around. And, um, that's not a bad way to go either. It's, you know, kind of blending that overly sweet one with, with the dry that kind of yielded some, some favorable results that way. You might be okay uh, if you put those in secondary and they didn't actually ferment. Uh, I think it's something with the fermentation that does it, uh, okay. that transforms it into the cough syrup flavor. But it's definitely there, I can promise you. Yeah. Uh, because I have access to lots and lots of sweet cherries. Tart cherries are very difficult for me to get where I live. So I've tried in every way I know to use sweet cherries and, and every time they've been a failure. Uh, so I just don't even try anymore. <laughs> and I wish Bentner's harvest would make that cherry puree in a, uh, in a tart cherry because they, uh, it would be so handy to have, but they don't. There's a, uh, a grocery store up here in Wisconsin called Woodman's. And this is a store that, I mean, they've got, 15 to 20 different varieties of just anything that you can imagine. And um, every time we go there, I'm, I'm always like walking through the honey section and the, the frozen fruit section. And anyways, they've got these big bags of, I think it's like Dole or I forget exactly what the brand is of, of tart cherries. Um, and every time we go, I keep thinking, Oh, one of these days I've, I've got to pick that up. Cause I, I, I'm just really interested to try like a, a nice tart cherry melomel one of these days. Mm-hmm. Well, I wonder. Um, I, I wonder if adding, I don't know, some kind of spices, cinnamon, uh, vanilla beans, or something uh, that would help cut that. That uh, the v- vanilla doesn't work. I don't know about the cinnamon, but the vanilla doesn't work. I've tried that. Uh, I'll send you, uh, Aaron, I'll send you a bottle of, of one of my cherries. The, the cherry is one that I make all the time uh, because it's one of the favorites of, of all my friends. 
So I'll uh, I'll send you a bottle of that, and it's made from uh, uh, Balatons. Sounds awesome. Well, I'll I'll definitely look forward to that. Um, how do you? Where do you get your cherries from? If you don't mind my asking. <clears throat> well, I've got two. It depends on on which ones I want. If I want Morello or if I want Balaton, um, it turns out that you can get a cherry concentrate that's made from Morellos. Uh, here where I live, you can get it at Kroger, uh, but you can also order it online at, um, uh, let's see, Rose, let's see, let me think now, something acre. Farm Brown Brownwood Acre Farms dot com. Uh, put that in a Google search; it'll it'll come up. Uh, but they sell a Morello concentrate, and it's very good. Uh, if I want Balaton cherries, uh, those uh, I haven't found a, a juice or a concentrate, so I buy those whole frozen, and those come from um, Traverse City, Michigan. And if you will uh, Google that, Traverse City, Michigan, uh, Balaton cherries or something like that, it'll come up. And you can buy a uh, a five-gallon pail frozen, uh, and they're not very expensive, but they're they're excellent tart cherries. Cool. Well, thanks for the advice. Uh, like the sounds of that. We uh we've got a caller on the line uh uh let's see eight twenty four welcome to the show hello okay well I guess they uh, <laughs> uh let's try it again oh guess not all right well hey uh thought we had a live one there for just a second. Uh, Jeff, is there anything, uh, anything in your experience, uh, that can be done to this cherry mead to try to offset that? I know Chris has done uh, just about everything, but, uh, is there something yeah, that, um, that, uh, you know, really, I'm, I'm not as experienced with melanols as I am with, uh, with the methaglins, but, uh, my instinct says if, it, if you're going to do, uh, something with sweet cherry, you've got to do something to offset it with either. Uh, you've either got to dry the meat out pretty thoroughly or you've got to, you got to do some acid, uh, to counteract all the sweetness. Um, there, there are plenty of, and there's a type of mead, um, I've heard referred to as like a sweet tart mead that just feels artificially sweet and artificially acidy at the same time. I would try to avoid that. Um, but there does need to be some balance to it. And I, I wouldn't know exactly what I would add because it seems like uh, uh, something like a lemon or uh, citrus fruit wouldn't necessarily play as well with a cherry as um, as other fruits would. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm just I'm and just we'll laughing over here. That, that that sounds like my my cloyingly sweet cherry melamel, artificially sweet and artificially tart from from the acid blend. I mean that. That's kind of what mine tastes like when I when I add that acid blend in there. Yeah. They were they were warning us about those at the uh, the tasters exam I had for the BJCP. They were calling it uh, sweet tart needs. Yep. Um, <laughs> I would. Yeah. If if there's anyone out there listening who who uses sweet cherries and and makes a good mead with them, please let us know because I would love to find out how to do it. Uh, I, I have yet to be able to pull it off. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know who this is, the 8824. They keep on calling, but I'm having a difficult time getting you into the show here. So uh, shoot me an email, uh, jdweb at jamesdweb.com, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, get this handled a different way. But. Uh, Apologize for that, but you're—I uh, don't know what's going on. Just can't get you added in the show. But uh, anyway, well, it, it sounds like we're not going to be of much help for Robert, uh, other than telling him to leave the cherries out, maybe go for a traditional with a wildflower. And, <laughs> and I would definitely, definitely skip 
the uh, the sweet cherries for now. Um, if you want to see what they do, make a one gallon batch with about three pounds of of the sweet cherries, uh, ferment it out, and then taste it, and you will. If you've ever had cherry flavored cough syrup in your life, you will recognize it immediately. Yeah, I have. Uh, that's that's the best advice I can give. Wow. Well, just, uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one other thought I have, and, and I don't know if the three of you would agree with this or disagree, but just a, a general comment on, on my couple of experiences with these, these fruit purees. Um, not a huge fan, to be honest. I, I, I think um, wherever possible, I, I would in the future just steer more towards the whole fruit or, you know, the actual fruit itself or, you know, I definitely would, would try like a concentrate or a juice or something like that um, just because I, I haven't really gone that route before. But that's just kind of been my experience with the, the cherry and peach purees so that the, the natural fruit works better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've heard it both ways about those, but uh, if you're going to use purees, I have heard that the Vintner's Harvest is some of the best you can get. Uh, I've used it. Uh, I used their black currant once, and it was it was pretty good. Okay. But that's the I think that's the only one that I've used from them. I'm trying to remember. I did a raspberry one time, and I used a puree, but I don't remember if it was Ventner's Harvest. I think it probably was. That's been a long time ago. Now, Chris, if I can ask, what all went into yes. the? Uh, what were you using the black currant for? Was that part of the Heart Murmur project, or was that something on its own? <clears throat> I'm just curious because black um, currant is a pretty strong flavor. Yes, and uh, I found that out the hard way in the Heart Murmur project. Uh, <laughs> the first, uh, the first two uh, test batches that I did, I think all the problem was with too much black currant. Um, so yeah, you can really overdo it, uh, even if you're making a straight black currant mead. Uh, you really got to be careful with it, or you're going to have to. You're going to have to keep your sweetness level up really high to balance it, and you may even have to look at something like a malolactic fermentation to help soften it some, um, because it's got a lot of acid. It's really tart. Um, I, uh... The puree, the Vintner's Harvest puree, uh, black currant that I used was just for a, a black currant melomel. Um, and that's been that's been quite a while back, and uh, and it really turned out pretty good. Uh, but I was not raised eating black currants, so to me it tasted good. But for someone who grew up with black currants and knows what fresh good black currants are, they might have a a different opinion of it. Well, well I remember I know, uh, when I was living in. Go ahead. Sorry. When I was living in Europe, I enjoyed uh, uh, the uh, a fruit drink with some black currant, and I think it was just uh, cut with apple juice uh, because it was it was not the tartness of black currant I found here. Um, so yeah, like Ribena uh, or something. And I think about a month and a half ago, I got a bottle of black currant juice at the health food store uh, just to kind of play with and see if I wanted to put that in a mead. Um, I didn't warn my wife that black currant is very very tart. So she came home and poured herself a glass of it just straight. And I, I got cussed out for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and to give you some idea of how sweet uh, you're going to have to finish your mead in order for it to balance, uh, if you take that – did you get something like R.W. Nudson or something, uh, black currant juice? I'm, I'm not sure. It was um, it was from the natural grocers. It's like a equivalent to a, a Whole Foods. Um, just got it off the aisle. Yeah, it was probably Nudson's, um, and they have a good black currant juice. Uh, but just to give you some idea, uh, take your hydrometer and test the gravity on that juice alone. And you know, the juice itself is like uh, 
Oh gosh, it's like fifteen or eighteen bricks or something. I mean, it's it's really got a lot of sugar in it already. So you know, you're looking at a finishing gravity on a mead in order to balance it. I mean, we're talking like you know ten ten fifty, nah, give or take. You know, just oh. to balance it out. If you go too heavy on it. Now, if you you know if you if you go lighter on the uh, the amount of juice you use, you can finish at a lower gravity, but um, you still got to have quite a bit of sweetness. Um, and it, uh, you know, interestingly enough, you would think a final gravity of ten fifty would be cloyingly sweet, but it's not. It doesn't even taste sweet at all. Uh, now, what kind of body do you get out of that? Is it a heavier body too? Go ahead. Chris? <laughs> Do we lose Chris? Um, oh, Chris, is uh, is everybody else still there? Mir- yep, still here. I think we got the three of us. Yeah. I don't know. We dropped uh, Chris. Uh, Chris is trying to call. I, Chris, if you're listening, I got to call you, bud. Um, all right, he should be uh, coming on here momentarily. Uh, I don't know what's going on with Skype, but uh, I keep getting a phone call from this 8824, and I'm not, uh, I have no idea uh, what's going on there. And I can't even now. I can't even get Chris back in. What the heck's going on here, guys? Uh oh. Um, God, you know, since Microsoft has taken over this damn thing, uh, Chris, uh, call the show, bud, if you're listening. But uh, let, let's keep going. I'm going to send Chris a, a text and have him call the show. Um, but let, let's keep going, uh, and, uh, see where we end up here with this, uh, with this cherry thing. One thing, uh, one, one thing that I have found out in working with a lot of fruit, of course, I mean, everybody, you know, the big thing is more fruit, the better. And, but I think that only goes so far because there are, uh, there are some there are some fruits where more fruit is not better, and I'm thinking of the berry family, like uh, like raspberries, say for example. I mean, that's uh, that's a lot of tartness being added to your to your mead, because raspberries is a very tart berry to start with. They're not a typically sweet. Neither is a blackberry. Uh, you know, boysenberries, uh, I mean, in pretty much any of the berry family, with the exception of maybe strawberries. I mean, how, how do you yeah. guys? Yeah, I, I would agree with that and, and would also lump the, the black currants in there as well. And <laughs> Definitely. Um, it's almost, it, it's been interesting listening to some of the, the recipes that Chris has been coming up with you know, as he, as we were discussing earlier with the finishing gravity of 1050, the first thought when, when he said that, I mean, that's darn near close to what I'm planning my starting gravity to be for, for this session hopped mead that, that I'm putting together here. So just, uh, it, it's almost like the, the more tartness that you're adding with raspberries or blackberries or black currants and things like that. It's, you need the higher finishing gravity then to counterbalance that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. I don't, I have no idea what's going on, but suddenly Skype is not letting us add anybody to the show. Um, and I hate to, I hate to do this. I mean, if it wasn't one thing, it's another. You know, shame on Microsoft. Uh, what I'm going to have to do is uh, I'm going to I'm going to throw a song up here, 
and uh, I'm going to have to dump Skype and then uh, reconnect everybody. So uh, sit tight. Uh, we'll play a couple of tunes here. And when we come back, we should have uh, everybody back on there. So uh, sit tight. Chris is back. Um, apologize. We had to dump. We had to actually dump Skype and get everybody out of the call and start all over again. I have no clue what's going on, but uh, we're all back. We're trying to help uh, Robert Lloyd Moreland out with this Cherry Melomel that uh, that he wants to do. He found his post <coughs> on the Mead Facebook page uh, today, and it doesn't sound like we're going to be able to be of much help as far as the cherry goes. It's just the wrong kind of cherry. Uh, the sweet cherry, Robert, uh, is just gonna, it's going to leave you with a cough syrup-like tasting mead. And I really don't think, uh, you know, especially if you're a newbie, if you're new at doing this, uh, that would really probably disenfranchise you from ever making it again. So, and we, we want you to keep making good mead. Just don't use sweet cherries. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we uh why don't we just post him up a good cherry mellow metal recipe on the website and uh let that, try that we can let that be the recipe of the recipe of the month or something. Yeah. 
All right, now we have caller 8824 on the line. What's your name? Where are you from? And welcome to the show. Okay, apparently that's not working either. So, uh, hello, 8824, can you hear us? No, apparently not. Okay, so, um, all right, so moving on then, um, I thought we'd spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what our favorite yeasts are. Uh, it was on our bucket list that we had worked on here, you know, when we launched the show. We got a whole list of topics and stuff that we kind of wanted to toss around the table. And I know um, I, I want to I start with Chris because, he, he, you know, I'm kind of following in Chris's footsteps now. 71B is quickly becoming my go-to yeast for just about everything I do. And, uh, mm. you know, there's a good reason for it because it's fast, it's quick, it starts good. Uh, it's the only yeast that I have used uh, that has started within several hours of pitching. Uh, and, I mean, it just chugs and chugs and chugs away uh, like nobody's business. So uh, that's my favorite. That's my go-to yeast. Uh, Aaron, do you have a favorite? You know, it's a good question. I, I think um, 71B would probably be my favorite at this point just because, uh, you know, a lot of the, the meads that I've made, the recipes have just kind of been whatever recommended recipe is is put together there at the, the local homebrew supply shop. And most of them call for, for 71B. Um, only recently have I started looking into other yeasts. Um, recently I've, I've used D47 on, on the honey varietal experiment. Um, I'm, I'm planning on this new batch using a, an ale yeast, the, um, Cephal US05. Um, Definitely have read about other types of yeast, and and to be honest, it's something that that in the future I definitely want to experiment a little bit more. But um, I, I would agree. I think seventy one B is is just a fantastic yeast for all of the reasons that you just described. Well, I find it's a it's a good all round yeast, and I don't know about you guys, but I, I almost uh, I've made it a practice to go on the uh, Lollamond uh, site, they've got quite an extensive catalog with very good descriptions and, uh, you know, uh, about these yeasts that they put out. And I go in there and I read these descriptions and I'm, I'm thinking about my ingredients in the back of my head, you know, is this yeast uh, uh, going to be good with the ingredients that I'm using? I mean, they've got, you know, yeast for white wines, yeast for red wines. And I really don't know if any of that even applies to mead making, Jeff. <laughs> you know, it, the funny thing about this is that I, I've got a couple um, yeast that I've been using a lot. D47 is really the one that I have the most experience with because it was the one that was recommended to me up front. Um, and along with the, uh, I don't know if you've seen the the activator packs for dry and sweet mead that Y yeast have. I've used those a couple of times. Um but D47 is the one that I put most of my experiments through. And it's it's an all right yeast. It's a good kind of a go-to. Um, I actually started my, my Cherimoya using the 71B. That's the first one I've ever done with 71B. Um, so I, I'm a little bit uh, uninformed as to that one. And then uh, last year I made a couple uh, different yeasts um, using the, the Safeale SO4. Um, kind of similar to the, what Chris was talking about with the USO5, um, I had really good results with those. I was very pleased with, uh, with, for one, how quickly and how, um, thoroughly it, it fermented. And then it produces a very strong, very compact, uh, lees at the bottom of the, the fermenter too, which those made racking really those super are easy. typically beer yeast, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's an ale yeast. I, I think it's, um, if I remember right, it's comparable to a Nottingham style um, English ale, yeah. and then US04 is a little bit more comparable to a, like an American IPA ale. I could be wrong. <laughs> Chris, uh, 
I know you pretty much run the gamut, but I know, I know you, you know, 71B is uh, near and dear to your heart. <laughs> yes, 71B is what I use for almost everything. Um, I've got a, a, a sourwood honey uh, traditional that's that I'm going to be starting, oh, I don't know, pretty soon, in the next few weeks maybe, I hope. And um, I'm going to try something different. Uh, I'm trying two two yeast combinations. Now, I've, I've used D21 before. Um, I've never used it in a traditional. Uh, but, you know, I was speaking to Pete Bakalich about this, and um, on his advice, we decided to do a blend. So I'm actually going to do two separate batches and then I'm going to blend them once they're finished. Uh, one batch is going to be done with D21 and the other one is going to be, uh, using RP15. And, um, so hopefully we're going to get a good blend. Uh, they, they should complement each other really well. Um, and these are, these are two yeast that, that we chose specifically for this honey. After discussing the the different characteristics of the honey and uh, different flavors and aromas, so hopefully we're going to make a a good meat out of this uh, by blending. Um, something else that I'm going to do a little bit differently than what I normally do, though, and then this is going to be a, a drier mead, and I don't normally make dry meads, uh, and it's not going to be bone dry, but uh, we're going to finish out, I'm thinking probably around 10, 10, maybe something there and along that line. So, um, hoping for something good out of it, but this, that'll be my first go with the RP 15 and it'll be my first try at blending those, those two particular yeasts also. Matter of fact, it'll be my first time blending D 21 with anything. Yeah. Well, do you, do you spend uh, from what I understand, or from from what I can tell, the D21 is basically all the same as the D47 without the worry of such strict temperature control. Yeah. Well, do you spend uh, do you spend considerable time or any time at all on the Lalaman site, uh, going through the catalog and looking at the yeast descriptions and trying to match up? Uh, you know, your ingredients to the characteristics of the yeast at all, or does that even... Yeah, I do. I, I, I don't spend a lot of time, but I have been on there, and uh, that was actually, you know, when you and I were talking about doing this coffee mead, uh, and I suggested the the 58W3, Yeah. Uh, that was one of the reasons I suggested that, was because... Uh, uh, the the description of it seemed like it would go with coffee really well, but we're trying to get this experiment done um, as quickly as possible. So we decided to go with a 71B because it ages so quick, so quickly. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the uh, the description for that sounds like it would go with a, a coffee mead really well. Uh, one thing I have noticed on that website though is that uh, you were talking about. Uh, how the yeast, uh, you know, the, the wine description, how it pertains to mead. Right. Uh, I don't really know if it does because it turns out that most of the yeast that we end up using are actually for red wines. Right. And you would think that, you know, with, with a honey, which, you know, you might go more toward a white wine yeast, but oh, yeah. uh, seems like seems like most of what we end up using is uh, is red wine yeast. Well, I mean, you know, and the only source, I mean, you mentioned his name, Pete Bockwich. I mean, he's the only source or resource that I know of. Uh, of course, I, mean, I, I had kind of an intimate relationship with him with the uh, Mead Gang over there and the show that we were doing over there. All I know is what he has told and taught me uh, about some of the different yeasts. And uh, there just isn't, there's just not enough data out there, or at least not enough com compiled data about yeast and mead making. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of information out there that I can find on on yeast and winemaking. I mean, obviously, that's what all these yeasts that we're using are pretty much geared for anyway. So, I mean, to me, it's a hit or a miss. Uh, Jeff and Aaron, mm-hmm. I mean, how do you find uh, how, how do you find it? I mean, I, I, are you able to put together what yeast works with what honey varietals, and uh, or is this is this still too new of an industry uh, to be able to come up with a compiled list like you you know that's shown on the Lalamon site that catalog that they have? Well, the funny thing about this question, though, is that actually you guys know about the the nutrient experiment that I'm doing right now. My my plan follow up to that was actually going to be different forms of yeast. Um, the the problem is that I only have about six of these um, little gallon sized fermenters, and there's way more than six varieties of honey that I want, or varieties of yeast that I want to try. Um, I, I found that like, go ahead. Oh no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I, I found that, um, like Steve Piazza's book or, um, or Ken Schramm's book both have pretty good chapters about the, the, the more basic, uh, varieties of yeast you can use. Um, but there are a number of other yeasts that I'm interested in trying, like the, the Safe Ale, uh, SO4 or USO4. Um, you know, they also make different lagering yeasts that I've heard can yield interesting results, but you have to gate age it for quite a while. Um, I, I'm, I've heard some people are getting very good results with like a Saison yeast or like a retinomyosis, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, more in the mm-hmm. beer yeast variety. Um, and again, we're getting back to the fact that meat is very versatile and there's a lot of potential here that may be unexplored. So, um, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's a fertile area to, I think, explore more for the home brewer. Aaron? And once again, you get into preference of taste. You know, you can take the exact same honey. If we bought a five gallon pail of honey, um, so it, so that it's exactly the same, use the same water, uh, we're going to have different preferences. You know, you may like it to be lighter bodied and sparkling. Uh, somebody else may like it dry. Some like it sweet. Um, you know, it's just so much variation just in the taste alone and preference. Um, I, I think you just have to make what you like. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, so, uh, well, I think it's, you there's, know, it's, there's, it's, a, it's also a matter of, of, of arriving at what particular yeast that you want to use. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the question. How do you arrive? I mean, on, on, uh, how do you arrive at the yeast? you choose to use in, in your meat, Aaron? How, how do you how do you make that that uh, determination? It's a, a great question, and um, actually, as as Jeff was talking about his future plans to experiment with different types of yeast, uh, one of the the things that I was looking at before this show, and we had decided that we were going to talk a little bit about different types of yeast for, for the show. I, I started perusing a little bit through some of the, you know, the Mead Facebook groups. And I think it's just the, the plain, like the Mead group where I saw this. So wanted to, to give a shout out to a, a guy, Keelan Wilkins, who's part of the Mead Facebook group. He's put, put up a couple of posts about a very interesting experiment that he's doing using just a, a traditional orange blossom honey mead. He started this back in early March. It started with a pretty high starting gravity. It looked like about 1.156, which is about 35, 36 bricks, using the, the Tazna Tailored Organic Staggered Nutrient Edition Protocol. Um, and, and his experiment, basically everything is the same. He's doing four half-gallon batches in each one of those, he, he used two grams of different types of yeast. So, you know, 71B, kind of the go-to we've been talking about, the, the K1V 111.6, which is more of like a, a champagne yeast, a, a killer yeast that, that has a, a higher alcohol tolerance, the Cephal 
um, US05 that we've talked about, as well as the D47. So, so definitely would recommend to the listeners to, to go check out some of Keelan's posts on that Mead Facebook group. It's just been really interesting following along his, his yeast experiment. So to go back to your question, JD, when I'm looking at, at branching out into different types of yeasts and kind of stepping outside of my 71B comfort zone, that's typically the way I'll go is, you know, whether or not it's it's these Facebook groups, whether or not it's, you know, Ken Schramm's book or or a host of different homebrew forums online, that's usually the process I go is I, I just go out, I I find as many resources as I can. I look for people that, that have had experiences with different types of yeasts where they, you know, write a little bit about what they liked, what they didn't like about the different yeasts, and and then use that information to kind of base my decision off of. Yeah, yeah, I. Uh... I the, the reason I keep reaching for seventy one D there's there's two reasons. Number one, uh, people like uh, Ken Schramm and Michael Fairbrother, and I think he, maybe even Sergio uh, Matella. Uh, I know for a fact Michael Fairbrother and Ken Schramm use 71D almost exclusively, right. if, if not exclusively. So we know, number one, it makes good mead. Number two, it ages quickly. And, you know, I, I honestly, I don't want to wait a year to enjoy it. So why why would I want to wait a year if I can get good results in three months? So... That's why I keep reaching for 71B. It's fun to experiment with different things, but, you know, you got to pick and choose your fight. So if you you got something you want to make and you don't mind waiting, uh, that's fine. And and who's to say that if you follow good meat-making practices that, you know, maybe you can drink it earlier than a year. Uh, But I know 71B will do it every time. Well, and I just, uh, you know, I get uh, I get stuck on that Lalaman. I love that Lalaman site. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I like reading about all the different characteristics uh, and learning about the different characteristics that each yeast will present. But it's overwhelming at times because, you know, I sit here with a recipe in mind thinking, okay, I, I, I want this kind of yeast or that kind of yeast, so I'll go to that catalog and look, and immediately I'm just overwhelmed. And, I, you know, and it's just i got to get out of that. And, uh, you know, maybe for that reason, I, I, I'm kind of following in, in Chris's footsteps. I like, I like, I've always liked 71B, and I think it is a very good all-around yeast. It's good with traditionals it's good with uh and i think it's commonly used with melmel that may be where it got its notoriety i believe that seems to be the go-to use for melmel anything with fruit in it so uh, but yeah and i think a lot of these commercial meteries uh are making a lot more melmel simply because it it tends to sell better probably uh people who are coming from a wine background are looking, you know, they expect fruit. Uh, and so it probably appeals uh, more to them. Uh, not to say that there's not a whole other crowd of people who enjoy methaglins or, or traditionals or whatever, but um, maybe well, that's the reason, because they yeah. use a lot of fruit. Well, and I, I, I mean, I, I would like to get to the point where, you know, I've got maybe three or four different kinds of yeast on hand in my store uh, that I can call upon at any given time when I put a mead together. Uh, rather than have to go to that catalog and search out a yeast that, you know, perhaps I've never used before, uh, I'm not sure that I want to take that risk anymore. I've risked two big batches with lots of honey. And I'm not happy with the results. In fact, one of them has already cleaned out the drains uh, of our local community here already. So, and that was that pumpkin uh, fiasco that I did. Tons mm-hmm. of honey went into that yeah. project, 
Uh, so that was very costly, and I wasn't I wasn't particularly pleased with the outcome. It had nothing to do with the um, use, but uh, you know, by the same token, before you spend that kind of money, I would just like to, for my own, uh, you know, for my own uh, mead making, I'd like to narrow it down to three or four geese that I can go to for any particular kind of, of situation or recipe that, uh, you know, I, I do like the Safal yeast. I, I, I like the, the 04, the 05, and I also like Nottingham for ciders, but that's a whole different ball game too. Yeah, for sizers, if I do anything with apple in it, I, I think I've said this before, I use one of the, what I call the D's, um, D47, D21, and DV10. Uh, those are what I would say are my apple yeast. Uh, a sizer is going to get one of those three. And almost everything else is going to be 71B. Well, uh, you know, here again, I mean, there's, uh, you know, the extensive list over at the Lalamon site, that big catalog that they've got. And we'll put that link up on the on the website. Um, but keeping in mind that's all generated towards the towards the winemaking uh, industry. Uh, how soon can we expect anything specifically for the mead baking industry? You know, you know that's. I don't that's know if a, we ever will. Yeah, or will we? <laughs> you know, will we ever get to that point? <laughs> You know, well, as, yeah. as, will the meat industry get to that point uh, of having uh, its own catalog of yeast? I, I've, I, I mean, I don't want to say yay or nay, but uh, uh, it would be nice. If I, I think that I think all those yeasts could end up with with a meat description, the same way they have a wine description beside them now. Yeah. Uh, I think they could end up with a meat description beside them as well. Uh, but you know, you got to remember, uh, these yeasts don't grow out in the wild and say, I want to be a wine yeast when I grow up. Right. Or, you know, it just so happens that over, you know, many decades, the winemakers have found that this particular yeast does well in, in this kind of wine. Right. So that's how they got labeled as this yeast or that yeast. And I think probably the same thing will happen with mead. Uh, and maybe it's already starting, you know, maybe 71B and D47 and Safal US05. You know, maybe these are the yeast that eventually mead makers are going to do the same thing wine makers do and so say, this is, this is our yeast here. Uh, who knows? So. And Chris, you, you touched on a point that this is just really interesting to me about how these yeasts didn't grow up thinking, oh, I want to be a wine yeast or an ale yeast when I grow up. It, like you say, it's just over decades, winemakers found certain strains of yeast that paired well with certain time, types of grapes. And, um, you know, I, I think up to this point, we've, we've talked a little bit about ideas for experimentation where it's, and I'm going to go back to my, my quality engineer nerdiness here where we've kind of been talking about this one factor at a time approach for experimentation where we, we identify one factor and vary that factor as an input to the process to see what effect it has on the output where the, the experiments that we've been discussing so far would be the yeast strain. I think what we need to to move towards is more of like a two factor experiment where we're manipulating two factors at one time, those being honey varieties and yeast. So, you know, if we if we were to go back to the honey varietal experiment that I've been working on, again, that would be like a one factor at a time type of experiment where we've we've manipulated that input we're we're looking at cranberry blossom raspberry um sunflower and um oh gosh what's the other one well four mm-hmm. different i'm sorry mm-hmm. 
Blueberry, yes. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> um, so, so, and this is where it gets tricky because the, the number of experimental batches or experimental runs just starts to grow exponentially. Wouldn't it be interesting to take each of those four honey varietals and then use four different yeasts for each of those? So on the cranberry one, let's look at 71B, D47, US05 and SO4, and then replicate that across each of the four honey varieties. But now, now we're talking 16 batches. You know, it just it uh, it just kind of grows factorially, if that's a word. Um, but you know, as as we talk about what do we need to do as an industry to get to that point, to me, I think I think we need to start broadening our experimentation just from this one factor at a time approach to, um, you know, manipulating multiple factors at the same time in, in the same experiment. Well, isn't that kind of right? And guess who, and guess who's going to do that? Yeah. It's going to be the home brewer who does it. There you yep. go. And that's why we're here. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, because the commercial guys can't, can't afford to, to, uh, take a chance on a 500 gallon batch when their livelihood depends on it. Right. Uh, but we can put together a one or three or five gallon batch at home and say, yeah, this worked good or no, that's not so, it's not so hot. So, uh, we're the ones going to be doing it. Well, yeah. Like our, like our little moniker, let us throw the honey out for you. Right. Well, and the other thing we need to consider from this experimental standpoint is, you know, really to to stand up to rigorous scientific inquiry, we need to be able to replicate these results as well. And more to the point, like these kind of experiments should be done by multiple different people in multiple setups um, so that we know if, you know, for example, if Aaron gets something really great with 71B and sunflower honey, um, we want to make sure that that's actually the 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 norm for that combination and not just a fluke because of uh, this, that, or the other factor that happened to be um, specific to that batch. Um, We really want to have these results replicated by multiple people in the field and kind of just confirm, yeah, no, this is, uh, this is awesome. This is what we need to do. Or "Eh, we need to, we need to look at this again. It's not so great. And it's a good excuse for everybody to make another batch of mead. Yep. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. You're doing uh, it for the betterment of science. <laughs> the Mead House, turning America into alcoholics. <laughs> for science. So, yeah. That's what I think every for time science. I open up a, a bottle of science, Mead. Yeah. Yeah. Down the hatch, for science. Medicinal purposes only. <laughs> well, you know. Can we, get, of, can we get for science put at the top of our webpage? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, and this kind of goes, uh, you know, because we're going to talk a little bit tonight uh, about the coffee experiment, just kind of kind of leading in that direction. Chris and I spent some time on the phone the other day kind of uh, nailing down our, our plan. Uh, I don't know that, well, I guess you could say part of the method uh, as well, but, uh, you know, taking off, we, we took notes from Eric Newquist, who was on the show uh, in the first segment that we did a few weeks back. And uh, Chris uh, paid uh, pretty good attention to what was being said by Eric, and I think we've come up with a pretty good experiment ourselves. Uh, yep. And uh, I, I don't know. And I think we would. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I, I don't know whether the coffee has arrived there yet or not, but... Uh, uh, I'm kind of waiting. No, I, I haven't gotten it yet. It'll probably be a couple of days. Um, but, you know, we need to – I think we were off the air last week when we discussed this. But to let everybody know what's going on, we had decided that J.D. and I are going to do exactly the same thing, same process, everything. But then uh, Jeff and Aaron were going to do uh, – uh, a slightly different, some sort of variation to it to see uh, we're, we're, what we're trying to do is figure out how to make the best coffee mead. Yeah. So um, we're going to actually have two experiments going. So Jeff and Aaron, uh, we need to get you guys 
our recipe and process in the email so that so that you guys can um, come up with your game plan, some sort of variation of it. Yeah, and, uh, and ours, uh, I mean, you know, to, to start out, I mean, the, the first part of the experiment, of course, is coming up with the correct coffee and the correct amount of coffee to be used. And uh, I kind of took the took the horse, uh, the horn, the horn by the horse. How, how does that go? Took the bull by the horns. Is that how that works? That, yeah, uh, there you go. Horse sounds by the right tail. to me. Yeah. So uh, I came up with the coffee. I sent uh, Chris uh, six ounces of uh, three different types of coffee that I uh, came back with. Um, that all of them are medium roast coffees and low acidity. That's one thing that, that we did pick up on from Eric. Uh, was that the darker roast seemed to produce a higher level of acidity and bitterness. Of course, I think the bitterness comes from the acidity in coffee anyway. So, um, so I mean, and we're only going to use four ounces. So the two ounces left over, we're going to brew one ounce of hot and one ounce of cold brew coffee taste each one of those from each of the bean, uh, the beans that we have, and make a determination from that which one tastes like it would be good in a, in a mead, I guess. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to arrive at that yet. Uh, and you, I, I, maybe we can't really tell that yet because we haven't sampled the coffee. Maybe we've got to taste the coffee first, huh? Yeah, it won't take me long. I can I can down six cups of coffee and <laughs> nothing flat. So. Well, I uh, you know we want to taste it hot and we want to taste it cold, uh, and and specifically the cold brew because that's what we're going to be using as the additive or the, or the you know it's going to go into the uh, into the mix, uh, and we mm-hmm. pretty much nailed it down to a seventeen and a half hour cold brew. Uh, that's kind of a scientific, uh, based on Eric's, uh, and, and Eric did all the science on it. I mean, he cold brewed coffee at different, uh, times, uh, for di- different length of time. And he arrived at 17 and a half hours being the optimum to, uh, keep with the low acidity and low bitterness, uh, but yet get the most, uh, Java flavor. So, and JD just and although to, that's what we're going to be doing, we we still have to determine whether Eric has the same taste in coffee as we do. Right. So, we may end up uh, tasting it and saying that's good for some people, but we would prefer this or that. So, go ahead, Aaron. Absolutely. So just to, to clarify for, for any of the listeners out there, I, I know when we were talking to Eric, this was something that I just have to, to plead my ignorance on. What is cold brewing? Is that it's just soaking the roasted beans in room temperature water for yeah. a period of time? Yeah, that's all it is. You uh, dump your nope. ground coffee in the water. Yeah. You, and it is ground first. Okay. You can grind it, although I'm not going to grind it. Uh, everything that I've read about putting a good cold brew together is to crush the bean. So I'm, I'm going to take a hammer, put it, I'm going to put it in a, uh, in a bag and I'm actually going to crush the beans with a, well, actually a mallet, uh, meat tenderizing mallet. Uh, I'm not going to grind it. And uh, crush the beans to a coarse crush, and then uh, in one quarter or, or no, one quart of water. Uh, let me get to my notes. I believe it was a quarter ounce, right, Chris? No, four ounces in four ounces. one quart of water. Yeah, four ounces in one quart of water, cold brewed. In other words, just dump it in the room temperature water, put a lid on it for seventeen and a half hours. And then strain it out, and then uh, you'll have your uh, your cold brew coffee. So, and you use that to make one gallon of mead. One gallon of mead. So. Mm-hmm. so that's part of your water. Yeah. Um, 
Now, now, here's something we didn't talk about, JD. Uh, do you prefer me to to do the same thing with the crushing, or you know, because I had planned planned on grinding it. Well, uh, you know, uh, that could be the variable that we want to throw in there too. I mean, the only other variable that we're going to be using is the honey. Now we're both using wildflower. But the variable is I'm using wildflower from my region of the continent, and Chris is using wildflower from wherever. From the Appalachians, yeah. From the Appalachians. From the Smoky Mountains, actually. Yeah. So we're talking completely different flowers, pollen, the whole nine yards here. So uh, no so problem. is that okay then for you to you do the, the coarse crush and I'll do the, the finer grind and – I don't see why not. Have that variable? Yeah, I don't see why not. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. not, I you know, and to be honest with you, I, I don't know. I'm not quite sure what difference crushing or grinding is going to make. It's just that everything that I've ever read about making cold brew coffee was that people crush uh, their beans or use uh, not the blade grinder, but what's, what's that other um, – the burr grinder, yeah, burr grinder, uh, to get a coarse uh, a coarse grind. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what the difference between you know between a burr grinder. Uh, I mean, I know the difference between a blade grinder and a burr grinder, but I'm not quite sure what the difference it does to the coffee. Uh, well, I, the way I understood it, Eric uh, Eric used a, a fairly fine grind, actually. He said it was somewhere between like a medium grind and, a, and an espresso grind, about halfway between. So it's it's got to be a fairly fine uh, grind that he was using. So that's sort of what I had had in mind to do with with this. So yeah, there's a there's a good variable there that that may make a, a world of difference. We never know. Yeah. So uh, and I'm we'll not- we'll try it that way. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, you know, there, there's a lot out there about cold brewing coffee, uh, and I'm, I'm not even quite sure if that even is going to make a difference. I, I, I mean, I have no idea. I don't know whether a burr grinded coffee or a crushed coffee or a blade grinded coffee is is that is it does it really make that big a difference? Yeah. Uh, mm. You know, I mean, there's just, uh, there's all different kinds of methods, uh, out there about grinding coffee. I mean, there are some coffee holics that absolutely insist that burr grinding your coffee is the only way to go. There are also those that, uh, opt for the crushed bean. Uh, you know, the coarser the better. And then there's a faction out there who uh, say, yeah, the fine grind, the almost espresso-like, is the uh, is preferable. So, I mean, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> we're gonna find out. We'll, we're gonna find out. Yeah, for sure. It does come down to it. Yeah, I, I want to hear. I want to hear what Jeff and Aaron are going to come up with on their variations. Well, I've been thinking it over since the last show, and I've got a couple ideas, but I'm a little bit uh, – at this point, I require further investigation before I really commit to anything because they, they could be pretty wild. <laughs> I think the only the only thing – the only rule we have is that it's got to be honey, water, and coffee. Yeah, nothing else. And yeast. Yeah, I think that's the only – uh, the only rule that we're playing by here. I can jive with that. And we're using 71. Chris and I are both using 71B. So, uh, yeah. Well, it sounds like we should probably use and, the 71B as well. And then it, there will be a, a wild variable that I think Aaron and I will probably also have to use wildflower from our region. Um, so that is, that's going to just be a factor that we'll have to take into account. That would, you know, I, I think that would be uh, that would that would put this whole thing into a good perspective because, you know, the one thing that a lot of people talk about are the honey varietals from different parts of, of the region. You know, 
Chris is Chris uh, is going to send me some wa- some uh, not wildflower uh, orange blossom orange blossom Florida orange blossom. He says it tastes quite a bit different than the California orange blossom. So I'm eager to try that. I mean, off the top of your head, I mean, orange blossom is orange blossom, right? Uh, or it should be, but it's not because you know we're we're talking three thousand miles different climates, different types of soil. Uh, and, you know, Chris was telling me that, you know, uh, they mix citrus. You know, the, the citrus groves, it's not all just oranges. There are other citrus trees amongst the groves, apparently, in Florida, whereas California, you don't, you don't necessarily find that. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I had spoken with a guy. Um, I was actually this has been probably a year ago, and uh, he was over in Georgia. He's a beekeeper, and uh, he had some Florida orange blossom honey for sale. And uh, <clears throat> so I called him to get a price on it and see how much he had. And we were talking about that, and he was telling me that uh, he takes his bees down to to Florida to the orange groves. That's where he gets his honey. And uh, and he said, you know, it's predominantly oranges, but he said every grove that I saw that I've ever been to down there always has uh, lemons and limes and grapefruits and all kinds of other citrus growing usually on the outskirts of the of the orchard. Yeah. So um, that may be a big factor. You know, that that may be why it's it's such a uh, I described it to J.D. as being a, a sharper taste. You know, what he sent me from California is very, very sweet. It's it's much thicker, but it's a lot more mellow. It doesn't have that little bit of burn in the back of your throat uh, that the Florida does. And I believe that may be because of those other citrus fruits. Yeah. Well, It's just an overall sharper Sharper and more zingy type honey than the than the California. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see what uh, what Jeff and uh, Aaron come up with as far as wildflower too, because I, I, mean, I I would like to get samples of wildflower honey from different regions of our country, and I, I may just look into that and. Uh, you know, because I'm on my second, uh, and I'm going to get another one here in a few weeks. Uh, uh, but this is the next one I get from my source will be the spring bloom uh, that uh, occurred here just this April and May, and uh, I'm eager to try uh, to taste that uh, from my from my honey guy. Uh, the batch, the original batch that I got. Uh, was from a, a late summer, uh, a late summer uh, uh, flowering uh, pollen collection, uh, I guess you'd say. Uh, that's the stuff that I sent you, Chris. Extremely sweet. I mean, it was the sweetest honey. I, I mean, almost like sucking on a sugar cube. I mean, it was just so sweet. Very floral. Uh, the stuff that I got here, uh, oh, just a couple of months ago, uh, not quite as sweet, very floral, though, uh, a little bit darker than uh, than the one previously. And uh, I'm going to get another another five-gallon bucket from him here in about two weeks uh, from the spring bloom. So... Uh, and for all the uh, for all the bee nerds or mead nerds or whatever out there who like uh, all the little details and fun facts, um, you know, we were we were discussing this the other day about everything. All the honey that I've tasted from California has been much sweeter. It's more concentrated than what we have here. And uh, you know, I was just thinking about this. The bees, once they bring the make the honey and they put it into the 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 comb, uh, they they fan it with their wings to dry it. And once it gets down to a certain water content, uh, they cap it off. So uh, you know, I, we were thinking about this. Why is the stuff in California so much sweeter and thicker? 
And, you know, this may be entirely wrong, but this is how I reasoned it. Uh, we have a lot higher humidity here than they do out in California. So maybe it's a lot easier for the bees out there to dry the, the honey out. And maybe they're getting it a lot drier out there than they are here uh, before they mm-hmm. cap it. So that's why you, you're getting less water in the West Coast, drier climate honey. Therefore, it's, you know, the sugar is more concentrated. Now, I may be totally wrong about that, but that's how I reasoned through it. So, yeah, sounds reasonable. Yeah. Definitely logical. It sounds good anyway. It sounds like I really know what I'm talking about. Ah, doesn't it? Well, hell, you're a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you're a chicken farmer. Well, let's see, how did I put it? Uh, a chicken farmer who you does put it so many ways, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> chicken a farmer who does heart surgery on the side. Um, well, let's talk about bees here for just a minute. Uh, I wanted to get an update uh, because this is something that's near and dear to my heart, too. I have always wanted, well, not always, just recently, in the last year or so, uh, or a couple of years since I've been doing this mead thing and become more and more interested in honey, uh, I would like to have beehives. But uh, let's get a check on uh, our uh, our in-house beekeeper, Jeff. Uh, how's the beehive doing? Well, they're doing pretty good. I still, uh, you know, they are restless these days. We have had a lot of rain, and of course, a rainy day means that it's a day that the bees cannot go gather honey. Um, they are they're getting sugar syrup from me, um, and they've been going through that like gangbusters. I bought a a value bag of sugar from Costco, twenty five pounds, and I swear they've eaten about twenty of it. So what do you um, do? just lay the bag out on the stoop and uh, actually I make a, a simple sh- a simple um, syrup, um, one part sugar, one part water by yeah. by uh, weight, yeah. um, and then uh, I, I have a, a couple of feeders in the uh, uh, the top of the hive. They basically crawl up into there, and there's some some window screens separating them from the syrup um, so that they can get at it but not drown in it. Um, they, they get that, they take it back down, and they're storing a little bit of it, but really they are using it to brood, uh, to build up brood. Um, I found out, I, I told you guys last week I had a, an adventure with a shot back and a, a queen that went rogue on yes. me. <laughs> yes. uh, I found her uh, the other day when I was doing a hive inspection, so she is alive and well and laying. Right. Um, that, uh, that hive seems to be doing well. My, uh, my other hive, the one that did not uh, swarm on me, um, that queen, I've not seen the last couple of inspections, but I've seen the, uh, the uncapped brood, which is the first three days after a queen lays an egg, they get a little bit of a, uh, uh, it's not quite a larva stage yet, but it's, a um, it looks like a little white, uh, worm that kind of takes a C shape in the bottom of the comb. Um, so I know that she's been there. She's been laying eggs in the last three days. So that's kind of good enough for me for right now. I don't want to spend too much time digging after her. Right. Uh, so all in all, they're doing okay. I, uh, today's inspection, I saw a few of them, uh, coming back to the hive with, uh, with their little pollen sacks full. So they're starting to gather pollen in my area, which is nice. Um, that means I should be able to, to get them off the feeders here. Um, within another week or two, and let them just gather on their own. I know uh, the lake that I go to uh, to do my walks and do a little photography, and I'm always checking on the bees out there. Uh, and I'm, I pay very close attention to the amount of pollen that, that are on the hind legs uh, of these bees when I see them, even try to get a picture or two. Uh, so I'm, I'm always looking into that. And I don't know where these bees... I don't know where the hive is that they might go to, uh, be it a all natural type deal or somebody's beehive. But, uh, uh, that's one thing that I have found myself doing. Every time I go to the lake, I'm looking after the bees, looking at them, paying attention to them. Uh, and I wish that I could get in, uh, you know, get into that. But, uh, and uh, for those of you who are going to listen, I've got a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you, how, how do you tell, like, uh, I guess it just takes a trained eye, but 
how do you tell if they're carrying nectar uh, when you see them flying to the like where do you look on them with regards to nectar i don't i don't think you can tell um i'm pretty sure they ingest that and they have uh they have a series of glands that they they pass it through um between collecting it from the the, the flower and depositing it in the hive uh, and that those glands include enzymes and things like that that start the process of turning it into honey uh, in addition to just the drying out process you were talking about before um i'm pretty sure that's that's in a, a cavity in their their body so it's a little bit hard to tell but they have what look like saddle bags that they carry either the nectar or not, not the nectar the um oh. the pollen or the propolis uh which is another bee product um they carry those in in those little sacks and then they'll deposit those in the hive when they get there yeah okay okay you were talking about pollen i was thinking nectar right yeah, ne- nectar is the product of the pollen collect i believe is that right isn't the nectar the product of uh the pollen collection uh well, they- no um I, I think a nectar is a, a kind of a byproduct of the the flower that functions to um, to entice the bees or whatever pollinator is there to, to come visit the flower. The pollen is it's essentially the sperm cell of the the plant um, that that functions as their their reproductive genes are the, the the vector for that to reproduce. Um, it's mm-hmm. it's also a source of protein for the bees, so they gather it for that purpose. Well, I, um, and for those, uh, those of you who are going to download uh, this show or might be listening to it live now, I know the one, I know at least two of you are out there listening to it. Um, if you didn't catch the last show, last week's show, uh, that's where Jeff talks about going MacGyver on a beehive with a shop vac. You really don't want to miss that. So, uh, <laughs> you know what? And I'll take some pictures of that shop vac setup that I made just to, uh, to have us a little bit of fun yeah. for the website. Yeah, absolutely. Get the pictures to me. And uh, you know what? Get a picture, a description of how you put it together and everything. I mean, that's a perfect Rube Goldberg type thing we want to put on the web page. Exactly. Uh, along with all the rest of the Rube Goldberg stuff we come up with. I mean, you know, why go out and spend $10,000 on, on a thing that's going to get your thing back when – you know, you can do it with a shop vac and uh, some baling wire and great tape. I mean, what the hell, you know? <laughs> well, and my he put was an in line, he, he put an inline B filter on a shop vac. That's, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that is there, terrific. There are products out there that replicate what I did on a much more professional level. I mean, they... Uh, most of the, the, the B equipment suppliers have something like that that you hook a shop back up to, uh, to do just that. The problem is I couldn't afford to wait like two to five days to ship that out there. I had a swarm on my shed and I needed to, <laughs> I needed to get that queen surviving because yeah. she was going to like dehydrate there. So I had to think of something fast and I'm like, okay, I think I got the stuff to do this and it worked. <laughs> I'm still surprised that it worked. <laughs> Well, guys, uh, we pretty much uh, run the uh, run the hour and a half here tonight on the Mead House, and uh, you know it was a pretty good discussion about the yeast, which still, I mean, yeah, I, I get still, uh, I get overwhelmed sometimes when I look at the list of yeast out there that are available to us. Even when I go to my local brew shop, I mean, the guy's got bin after bin after bin after bin plus the refrigerator full of stuff. And I sit there and scratch my head, and I think, oh, my God, you know, what yeast am I going to use? Um, but I think we had a good discussion tonight on, on our go-to stuff, what works uh, for us, uh, you know, and it may work for other people out there. And I really don't think you have to go out there and stare at hundreds of packets of yeast. You know, find, find some good ones that you're comfortable in working with, uh, you know, the 71B, the D47s, and the 1118, I think it is, or, or it might even be the 1116, are, are pretty much the go-to yeast that I have discovered along my path. 
you can start there and then uh, develop your own taste from there. But, hey, you know what? It all starts with the experiment, and uh, that's what uh, mead making is all about for us here at home. So, J.D., that, can, I, can I throw one more thing in real quick before we sign off? Yeah. Uh, on, on the issue of these yeast, uh, for those of you who, who are maybe fairly new, uh, pick one yeast, doesn't matter which one, just pick one yeast and make all of your mead with it until you're making good mead. Uh, you, you want to make sure that you're making good mead, uh, because you may try a different yeast and you may blame it on the yeast when it's not the yeast fault. Right. Um, so, so learn one yeast, learn what it does and how to treat it. And once you're consistently making good mead, then start to experiment with yeast. Otherwise, you may be uh, blaming bad results on the wrong thing. Good point. Yeah, good point. And maybe that 71B is the one to start with.